What we have just seen are all accidents waiting to happen, but they could all be avoided, not by luck, but through proper hazard management. A hazard arises wherever and whenever a substance or work process or the layout or construction of the workplace presents the risk of injury to anyone in the workplace. Hazard management involves acknowledging that these hazards exist and working to control them at all levels of the organisation. Hey Gary! Yeah? Doesn't look too safe to me. Yeah, I don't like doing it too much. If you don't keep it compact, it overflows before you get a chance to empty it. Oh, there must be a better way. Well, we've been doing it like this for as long as I can remember, mate. Any accidents? Had a few close shaves. Any ideas how to improve things? <sighs> No, not really. OK, leave it with me, all right? All right, thanks, Steve. So, have you any suggestions? Oh, oh, well, look, why don't we empty them more often? Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe, but there is a substantial cost involved. Well, we could flatten the cartons first. Ah, that's a good yes, idea. Yes, yes, that's a good idea. We'll go with that. How's it going? Better. You health and safety boys don't waste all your time in those meetings. <laughs> this simple example shows the benefits of identifying hazards and doing something about them. No matter how simple or complicated the situation, hazard management is worth doing and it's worth doing well. The consequences of every accident are lost time, loss of production, an increased cost to the organisation and to the individuals injured, there is suffering, loss of enjoyment of life and financial strain. With hazard management, an ounce of prevention is worth a tonne of cure. Specifically, there are three steps to hazard management. Identification, evaluation and control. The first of these steps, hazard identification, is the subject of this program. Hazard identification simply means identifying which aspects of the workplace represent a threat to health and safety. It can involve looking at workplace layouts, work processes, people's level of training and their attitudes. Hazards may be obvious or hidden but in either case, their identification should be a priority with everyone in the workplace. Hazard evaluation involves determining how dangerous a particular hazard is and identifying which specific risk factors are present. The final step in hazard management is hazard control, and this involves the steps taken to eliminate or minimise the potential danger of the hazard once it has been identified and evaluated. The secret to successful hazard evaluation and control lies in the first step of the process, hazard identification. Whose responsibility is hazard identification? Before outlining the formal responsibilities, it is important to remember that a strict legal interpretation will be of little comfort once the accident has happened. Everyone at all times must be aware of the hazards and who to report them to. Hi. Everyone in the organisation has a specific role to play in hazard identification. Management must ensure that all relevant regulations are followed. They should put appropriate hazard identification systems in place and provide the resources needed and they should implement recommendations coming out of hazard management processes. On a personal level, Management should be open to input from everyone in the organisation and recognise the priority that hazard management must have. Safety committees have a crucial part to play in hazard identification. 
In fact, many of the principal activities of the safety committee, from organising inspections to taking worker suggestions and investigating accidents, are concerned with hazard identification. Likewise, many of the duties of individual safety representatives involve collecting information about hazards in one form or another. Supervisors are responsible for putting the changes recommended into place. Last, but certainly not least, the detailed knowledge they have about the workplace means that the workers themselves are the source of much of the information about hazards. Of course, as the people most in the firing line, they have a special reason to ensure that their concerns and suggestions about hazards are passed on to management and that something is done about their concerns. Finally, it is up to you. So how do we identify hazards? There's a broad range of procedures that can be put into six categories. Employee input, conducting safety inspections, analysis of safety data, use of specification and records, accident investigation and follow through. As we have seen, the responsibilities for this are spread through all levels of the organisation and it is important that everyone have a good understanding of the process. The best way to illustrate these points, however, is to focus on the safety committee and the safety reps' roles in performing these tasks. Steve! Yeah? There's a lot of water there. I reckon it's dangerous. Yeah. Well, I mean someone could slip. Yeah, I'll get someone to clean it up. Well, I think someone should do something about it because it's always happening. Yeah, OK. Well, I'll, I'll make a note of it. Is this listening to employees? What do you think the consequences of the safety reps' actions are? And what do you think should have happened? They might not be so lucky next time. Now, let's see what should have happened. Steve! There's yep. a lot of water around there. I reckon it's dangerous. Yeah, right. Right. Can you bring the mop bucket and the warning sign, please? Right. I mean, someone could slip. Oh, exactly. There always seems to be water there. Always? How often? Every morning after they water the plants. Do we have to water them? Well, yeah. I mean, it keeps them looking good. They do need water every day. Hmm. Can you think of any way around the problem? Yeah, well, perhaps we could water them at the end of each day. Then any leakage would either evaporate or be mopped up by the cleaners when they do the floors in the morning. That's a great idea. I'll take that up at the safety committee meeting next week. OK, yeah. see ya. Thanks. Good job, mate. Just listening, then, is not enough. Proper reporting is essential, as is asking backup questions to find the real cause of the problem and then to get suggestions from workers. Conducting regular safety inspections is perhaps the most visible aspect of hazard identification. Continue. Safety inspections can look for things like broken or malfunctioning machinery, incorrect working materials, blocked aisles, passages or liquids spilt on floors, as well as environmental factors such as excessive noise or poor light. Inspections should also look for organisational problems like fatigue, unsafe working procedures and inadequate training and supervision. There are two ways to conduct a safety inspection. That was one way, the wrong way. What do you think was wrong with those inspections? Now, let's look at the right way to do it. Safety inspections should be coordinated by the safety committee. Using a plan of the workplace and a schedule, safety representatives should be assigned to inspect areas in which they do not usually work. 
That way they will be less likely to take what they see for granted. The inspectors should use a checklist specifically designed for that particular area. It must be remembered that the aim is not to assign blame, but to identify hazards. Finally, the information collected should be reported in the most appropriate way. When it comes to finding out about hazards, most organisations already have a lot of information. In some cases, it can look like too much information. Hidden deep in there is the information we need, but stuck in there it's of little use. Properly used accident and near-miss statistics can pinpoint those areas that should be a priority for corrective actions. The purpose is to identify why policies, procedures and practices have failed so that their reoccurrence can be avoided. The types of information that can be of use is contained in health and sickness records, health surveys, consultants and inspectors reports, and environmental and medical reports. Another type of analysis that is very important is to look regularly at procedures and systems of work. This should be undertaken by the safety committee. Doing this in conjunction with workplace changes associated with quality and productivity improvements can lead to very important results. In this factory, if it was redirected in a more linear way, there would be improvements in general housekeeping, worker safety and in productivity. Some very important hazard information is actually supplied with some of the hazards themselves. Chemicals, for example, should be well documented as far as their hazardous properties are concerned. Just as there are government regulations concerning the storage and use of chemicals, other items are covered by regulations that should be identified and used to ensure that all equipment and materials meet the relevant regulations. Any new items bought into the workplace should be inspected for hazards and it should be ensured that all purchase orders contain the appropriate health and safety specifications. A near accident can tell us as much as an actual accident. In fact, in the most serious incidents, it is only with a near miss that the key eyewitness will still be alive to give his account of proceedings. All injury accidents or near injury accidents should be investigated as soon as possible after the event. An immediate chronology of lead up events, including eyewitness reports collected. An accident investigation form should be used and most importantly should be acted on with the appropriate urgency. The point of all these forms is not to lose the paper war but rather to make sure that things are investigated in a logical step-by-step -step way and that nothing is left out. With proper documentation, the cause can be more easily traced and there is a clear responsibility for implementing improvements.